right. So we are talking Halloween horror movies for Halloween. You picked Alien. Did you stick with Alien? I, I thought, you know, we, we were going to talk about our favorite horror movie. And I've, I've told you that for me, it's always been a hard decision between Alien and The Thing. Because they are two of my favorite movies. And and the more I think about it, what's weird is is Aliens definitely the more popular movie, but I think the thing might be a better movie. Yes, and we can go into that. Though I, as I was doing it, I thought what kind of may be a one A for me as far as the horror bit is The Shining, which I actually find scarier than the thing. Though I really enjoy the thing, particularly watching again today. I don't necessarily find it scary at this point, whereas I still get kind of chills from. The Shining, but I do very much enjoy the thing. Did you have a chance to watch? I did not have a chance to watch Alien. I did watch the thing. Did you have a chance to watch one or both of those since we uh, talked last? I I kind of went through my favorite scenes from each, so I, I don't I don't know if that that's cheating, but I uh, I am I am familiar with with all the key points, and I have I've. I've seen them enough times that I feel like I can speak from a position of authority. All right. Which one would you like to go over first? Which one do you, uh, well, the safest thing might be to do chronological order. Uh, and, and so the thing comes first. And I guess one thing that I find interesting about, no wait, does it does hold on. Does it come first? If the thing is 82, I thought, I'm sorry, the alien, alien comes first, alien comes first. Right, okay. And, uh, cause alien is 79 and the thing is 82, 79. Right. So, all right, sorry, go ahead. So, uh, yeah, so I, uh, I felt like with Alien, I was exploring a lot of interesting ideas, but, but the unifying theme here is, is kind of the apocalypse, you know, in, in both of these films, the threat is currently quarantined and, and the minute it hits the mass population, uh, it, it's it's going it's going to do irrevocable damage. In Alien, what I always found charming is is that for the most part they're working Joes. I yes, guess they're that is a blue collar ship. Are they working Joes in the thing? At least oh, some the of thing. them. Yes. At least some of them are scientists in the thing. Yeah, I think there's a yeah there's a mix, right? The guy who is taking care of the dog. Seems pretty blue collar. Uh, right, but, but Wilford Brimley's character, Blair is definitely, Blair is definitely a scientist. Yeah. Yeah. It's a mix, right? So you got some kind of technicians, some sort of science guys, some kind of engineers and custodial types. Right. Um, I mean, McReady is just a helicopter pilot, but he's the guy who figures out how to, to get ahead of this thing. But I don't, I don't want to go too far into the thing. First off alien. Uh, what I, what I like about alien is, uh, it's beautiful. I mean, the, the movie, the movie is coming right there at the end of the seventies. It's everything I love about 70s sci-fi, uh, science fiction, um, from the set design. And then there's that, that really cool way that, uh, Ron Cobb, who designed things like the Nostromo and and all those interiors, um, his vision kind of mashes right up against H.R. Giger's, uh, which has the very biomechanical, um, unclean. You know, the the minute the minute the alien comes into the 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 picture, things are corrupted, and. And it, I know it's a deleted scene, but the, the, there's the moment that they cut where Ripley is down in the bowels of the ship uh, after she's set the uh, self-destruct to go, and she finds the hive. And and that was something that, that really inspired James Cameron because he loved the idea of the alien building a hive where it's making more aliens. And, and that's exactly what I love about that movie is it it just progressively makes you feel worse as this thing kind of, it's, it's like having roaches in your apartment. You you can have a 
spotless apartment and then a roach shows up and you feel like kind of both an invasion and a failure and how did, how did this happen and, and where are they and what are they doing? Um, does that make sense? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, the alien is kind of a giant, disgusting space roach. Yeah, in yeah. The way that they they take over your place, they make you fear the places that you were once familiar. Suddenly, you feel like it's lurking in there, and it's disgusting, and yeah, all that stuff. Absolutely. Right, and then there's the parasitic nature of it. I mean, I don't know. The alien isn't efficient as a menace. It, you, you have to go to the egg, trigger the egg. The thing has to get on your face. It has to be given time to gestate. And then once it's gestated and exploded out of you, it, at least applying pre-alien covenant, math, chronology, whatever, uh, it needs time to get big. And then it's an unstoppable threat. Nothing short of blowing it out of an airlock or shooting it to pieces uh, will destroy it. And even then, it's booby trapped because it has, um, as they put in aliens, molecular acid for blood. And and so it's just it's awful in every way, but it still takes a lot of work to get it there. Yes, it's it's vulnerable for a fair amount of its, I guess, growth or maturity process. And interestingly enough, I don't. Rem- you'll have to refresh my memory on in the movie if they they never seem to get a good grip on what's happening, or, or is it what is it it's wrapped around his internal organs in such a way that they can't get it out? So at least when the face hugger's in there, I remember that part where it's kind of in so deep they don't feel like they can remove it. But then the face hugger falls off, and they kind of. My recollection is that oh, the face hugger falls off. That's it. And they don't really check deeper to see if it left anything behind. Okay, so there, there's a couple things that happen. You know, they they get the distress signal. They they get to um, I think it's LV four twenty six and uh, the planet that winds up being called Asheron. Um, and they discover the the just. Dis- the signal isn't a distress signal, it's a warning. But they figure that out after they've sent a crew to investigate the alien ship. Uh, the corporation wants them to go to the ship. Uh, they are all guaranteed a bonus for finding alien tech. They go inside. Uh, it's it's Dallas, Tom Skerritt's character, uh, Lambert, um, Veronica Cartwright's character and uh, John Hurt's character, Kane. And Kane is the one who descends into the chamber where all the eggs are. And he kind of slips down into the egg bay, which is covered by a sealed sort of laser mist. And once he crosses into there, the egg opens up, jumps on his face. And they get him back to the ship. There is a big fight internally because uh, Sigourney Weaver's character, uh, Ripley, doesn't want to let him on the ship and break quarantine. And Ash, played by Ian Holm, lets him into the ship. And when they get Kane back to the med lab... Ash says, this thing's got it wrapped around his throat. If we try to remove it, it'll choke him. Um, They try to sever one of the sort of finger legs, whatever, that's holding onto his face, and that leads to it dripping acid blood that goes through several decks of the ship. And they realize if they try to cut the tail around his neck off, the acid will kill him. Um, in fact, in Aliens, when they have the, the two face huggers that are in jars, uh, Lance Henriksen's bishop points out in the, uh, the medical logs that the two guys they were removed from, the two colonists they were removed from died in the process. So, so once that thing's on you, um, it's not coming off. 
uh, which leads to that spectacular moment in Aliens where uh, Michael Bean and Bill Paxton are wrestling to keep the thing from closing on Sigourney Weaver's face. But yeah, it, at every stage, once it's out of the egg, it's lethal. Uh, it's it's most vulnerable when it's in the egg. And it's one of those things too, that if, you know, in a situation, if you came in, understanding the warning, if you just go down there and flame throw all the eggs, you know, obviously for a movie, that wouldn't make any sense for real life. Just go down there and blast the whole thing up. You'd be fine. But having goofed and done all that stuff that, yeah, once you, once it gets out of there and you let it slip out of the hallway and, and into the bowels of the ship, they don't know it yet, but it's their toast. The odds. Have, Somebody the odds is have getting turned. got. And the minute one of those things has the opportunity to gestate and then working against them. And I hope anybody who's actually listening to this has enjoyed both of these movies. This is more for just discussion purposes. Um, the, the big, the big twist within all the twists that happen in alien is that Ash, who was supposed to be providing the medical attention for the crew member who had been infected is actually an Android who wanted the creature to just stay to um, adulthood. And in birth, um, to go on a, to go on a rampage and the, the crew was expendable and it was determined that anything that was interested in biological matter would not be interested in killing an Android and Ash could get the ship home. Right. So, and that gets into the, you know, who's really the monster. Is it, is it the monster or is it us? Because we, we don't value human life. So the aliens plays on a lot of different levels. And then there's also, there's a weird yeah, undercurrent of, of, of sex themes going on. I mean, you know, the alien looks like a giant phallus. Uh, there's plenty of giant phalluses throughout the movie. Um, the, the fact that the alien, um, victimizes at least Veronica Cartwright in a very sexually aggressive way. Um, and, and even within the ship, and I know they cut scenes that would have explained this a little bit more, but the, there was kind of a theme of, of free trucker love where everybody on the ship had kind of slept with each other, but they cut a scene where Sigourney Weaver and Veronica Cartwright are talking about how, you know, they it's right after Tom Skerritt's character Dallas is grabbed in the tunnels and they say that uh, they both had a deep affection for him. And then they realize that the only guy that they've never slept with on the ship is Ash. And I, I, I'm glad they cut it because the first time I saw it, it, it's it's always a big surprise when Ash is revealed to being not human. Yes, I do enjoy that surprise. It's a nice uh, twist, right, on these films is having the non-human character, which, of course, the thing plays on a lot but this in a different ways you have the sort of person that you don't necessarily trust because their motives might not be their own right what's the hidden programming behind this being right and yeah i i think that also sort of plays off the whole idea of the corporate drone because ash is literally a corporate drone um and he, even going back to the whole subliminally sexual things, when he goes to kill Ripley, once she's realized that the, the plan is ultimately to let the crew die and the alien live, uh, he rolls up a pornographic magazine to try to kill her by shoving it down her throat. And... 
I don't want to be too Freudian, but considering that he is uh, impotent in that one way that the rest of the crew could function, it, it seems like a hell of a metaphor. Yeah, I would say so. I, I mean, I think those things are intentional, right? Because there could have been any number of things they could have had as a weapon. I think that they choose to use that one for a reason. Right. And what's funny is that I don't think anybody who goes into Alien now because because the franchise is synonymous with Sigourney Weaver. The first time I saw it, I was I was 10 years old. And to to jump anyone who's younger listening to this into the Wayback Machine, there were actually two formats for home video cassette uh, when people were actually watching on cassettes. You saw it on Betamax? Is that what you're going to say? I saw it on Betamax. I saw it on Betamax. My dad was uh, insistent it was a superior format which made renting videos a nightmare. And he came home with a copy of alien on Halloween. And uh, he and my mom both had night jobs and, and my dad kind of, you know, said, Hey, I can either, I can even drive to the babysitter. I can either drive you home or we could all watch alien. And, and we, I wanted to look cool in front of my babysitter so I was like, oh, I'm fine. I'll watch Alien. And uh, it was terrifying. And I think I had nightmares for years. Uh, but it was also, it was amazing. And I mean, I'd, I'd been at summer camp and I had had camp counselors talk about the movie to the point where I felt like I knew everything that was going to happen. So what were the surprises going to be? But it's shocking. And, and it even watching it for the first time and maybe it's because of star Wars and, and I I'm 10, so I'm not watching this until 1985. So moving it out for six years. And I guess I'd been conditioned to, I, I thought at some point Dallas was going to be the one who saved the day uh, because I'd seen so many sci-fi where, you know, that, that gruff hero, and so that Dallas completely walks into a trap and Ripley Ripley winds up being the one who ultimately survives and gets the one up on the alien was, was amazing. And I think where alien isn't as good as aliens is I don't know that Ripley has much of a journey. But there's, it's not that she needs one. You know, from the start of the film, Ripley is is the most competent person on the ship. And she's the one being smart about everything. So it's it really shouldn't be surprising that, that Ripley is the last one standing and that she wins. Yeah, I mean, I feel like her journey is pretty similar in Aliens, where she starts off kind of being there and is supposed to be the kind of person for different reasons who is sort of the token we should be doing what she tells us to do but that is pretty much ignored or you know that is i mean basically ignored or or just given lip service to and then of course ends up being proven correct and then has to sort of take charge right in aliens she's brought in specifically because she knows the aliens but they don't really listen to much that she has to say until everything goes sideways and in Alien, she's like the protocol. I don't know what her thing is. Right? She's supposed to be handling kind of protocols and that sort of safety type stuff. And again, people don't listen to her until things go sideways. Yeah. I, I, in Alien, I think what's weird, because I I can't tell you how many times I've rewatched the movie, is that characters progress. I realize characters do a lot of dumb things in Alien. Um. You know, and may, maybe it's because I was I was complaining about how in a film like Covenant or Prometheus before it, everybody just kind of rushes to the next disaster. Like like with some just a little common sense, uh, 
a lot of what happens in either of those movies could have been avoided. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, they do ridiculously dumb things in that movie. And I think that's something that I appreciate about both these two movies is that you at least have a few characters who are trying to do the smart things. They don't always work and they're not always right. Right. But they're trying to do make intelligent choices. Whereas in those other movies, yeah, they just seem to just run headlong into disaster. And you wonder how these people ever got their jobs. Yeah. You know, because they have, they're so irresponsible. Right. I mean, it's, in Alien, they're wearing their helmets. They keep their helmets on. It, it, it's only because the thing was able to burn through Ash's helmet that he gets infected. And and even though it, it might have made things easier if Lambert and Dallas had pulled off their suits to carry him back, they keep them completely on until they're in inside the ship again. Uh, and that, that was a frustrating thing. The way these movies operate off of kind of the later movies operate off of manufactured timelines. Like we just landed on the planet. So everybody's got to, got to wander out right now as haphazardly as possible, even though there's a storm coming. And an alien has a great logic to it, but then it falls into some horror movie tropes. They, they keep splitting up. They, they put characters in intentional situations that, that are fantastic. I mean, the whole sequence where Dallas goes down into the, um, access tunnels to flush the creature out. Uh, now, do they know at that point what a cosmic horror the alien is? or, or, or the, I'm forgetting. Like, when do they find out that this thing is not just going to be a, you know, a, 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 a roach the size of a large rat and it's going to be... So it explodes you know, out of... Man it, explodes killer. Out, it explodes out of John Hurt's character, Kane. Uh, during the, the, the meal. Right. At that point, it's like a squirrel size or something like that, right? And right. And it goes racing off. But when did they realize that? Because you could so, see some of the decisions if they thought this is its final size. It's basically an angry squirrel. Right. Um, so they, they they think it's that size. And in, in what I have to, you know, because the movie is never really like, it's been this many hours. But... In a matter of hours, while they're looking for it, and they have all split up to cover ground, and they've all kind of got poles to sort of, you know, skewer it, uh, like they're going to catch a snake. Uh, Harry Dean Stanton wanders into a room, I, I think it's a, like, cooling something or other, because there's all sort of sorts of water dripping from the ceiling. Um, and he spots Ripley's cat, Jonesy. And he's trying to get the cat out. And, you know, the cat, the cat's used for a jump scare, and then it's, it's, it's not the monster, it's the cat. And it, it's a nice bait and switch, because while he's looking at the floor, uh, you don't realize that the what's dripping from the ceiling is also the creature's drool and it drops from the ceiling and, and it grabs him and it, it, you know, punctures some part of him with his tongue and then, uh, and then drags him off into the rafters. And there's a deleted scene where where uh, Yafikoto and Sigourney Weaver run in and witness this, but um, in in the final theatrical edit, it goes straight from that to Yafikoto uh, Parker recounting to everyone else what he saw, and so that at that point they do know it's seven feet tall. And it, 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 you know, it has a prehensile tail and can seamlessly move up walls. 
So, and it, and, and it just, it killed one of their crew members in front of them. So, while Tom Skerritt is, is definitely armed with a flamethrower, they don't know how effective that's going to be. Yeah, well, they, I mean, they don't know anything much at that point other than this thing is supremely dangerous. I guess this is where we get into the horror movie thing of the alien is exactly where it needs to be when it needs to be there to catch right. him, right? Because if it's an animal, how the heck does it know where on the ship it should be to intercept this person that's doing something that's going to potentially destroy it? It just happens to be there. Right, and that's where I, I think, you know, with any movie... Have you ever gone back and watched something you loved so many times that you started to see the seams? Absolutely. Yeah. And and that's that's the danger of having watched Alien as many times as I have is at some point I realized that so much of that movie is built around the centerpieces, but what makes it great is the fantastic moments in between where where these characters shine they're all they're all interesting people uh when, when recently a friend was pointing out that if you pay attention to um when paul riser is sitting down with ripley uh, at the beginning of alien and and she's going over the the logs of all of her dead crew members um there's a line in there about uh, on Lambert's profile that says uh, went through gender reassignment at youth. And, and I have no idea if that was Cameron trying to say that, you know, the, the buzz cut that they had on Veronica Cartwright was supposed to make her look masculine or if it was trying to there in 1986 be, forward thinking about um, transgender characters, but uh, I haven't, I haven't dug deep enough to find out if, cause alien, that's the other thing is alien went through several rewrites. You know, it was originally uh, Dan O'Banion um, retooled elements of his script, dark star which has a completely ridiculous alien. It's like a beach ball with duck feet. With duck feet. Um, it made something truly horrifying. And then uh, 20th Century Fox, uh, I know Walter Hill did one of the rewrites. And so it's kind of a stew. But it's a good stew. It's a good stew. I think Walter Hill added the android, and and I I think the android isn't. You're so worried about this monster that you don't even think about how creepy it is that Ash is fascinated with the creature, and then he's breaking protocols, and and even sort of the sinister very subtle moments where he's kind of telling them, don't worry about what you see up on the monitor while it's clear that something is growing inside of him. Um, they all kind of gets buried and, and, and that, that reveal when he starts bleeding milk after Sigourney Weaver hits him is fantastic. Um, I mean, it's and it's got a lot of great actors in there. Uh, oh yeah, taking on all the parts. It's a film where everything is top notch, and I don't know if you've ever seen what uh, Ron Cobb's original design for the alien was going to be. Um, but it's it's ultimately very good that they brought in Giger. I mean, if I remember correctly, that was partially because he and O'Banion had both worked on Jodorowsky's Dune. 
I believe you're correct about that. Yeah, I've heard that. Uh, I have not seen the making of. There's like a making of that dune, I think, or some documentary about yeah, that. But I know that a lot of the artists that were involved with that went on to do things like Alien. And I believe Dan O'Banion um, was one of those. Yeah, I just sent you what the Alien that Ron Cobb, Ron Cobb looked like. And I, I don't think that that would have been quite as iconic as what H.R. Giger meant. No, I mean, yeah, the, the, the classic alien is pretty iconic for reasons. Just a great creature design. And it definitely makes you think of a really disgusting, massive cockroach. Just with the kind of the, the exoskeleton. And uh, obviously, I don't know. If, I don't think cockroaches have dual mouths. But just has a very creepy sort of insectoid no, look I, to I, it. I, and I believe that was patterned after a type of eel. Um, I think there's an eel that, that does that. Um, but even, and there's so much going on. I mean, I know there were things Giger tried, like, originally the head actually had a real human skull in it, and they filled it with maggots, and the problem was is that that looked cool for about you know, an hour and then all the maggots died. Uh, so nice. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, it's, it's the kind of thing that like sounds fascinating. And then you realize you actually have to have this thing on set for weeks. if not months. Yeah, Well, you know, you got, so that's what the maggot farmers get to get, make their money. That's, how, that's why they get paid. Right. Right. And then we talk about the ethical treatment of maggots. Very much so. so. Does that mean they had a fly problem, and then you have to bring in spiders to get rid of the flies? That right. The spiders. Whole right. ecological disaster in the making. Right, and you have to get a spider wrangler on set. Uh, so, what's your favorite? What's your favorite moment in the uh, in the film? What's your? I it, do you go to the character moments, or do you feel like the iconic alien takedowns, or the, or, or the what's uh, it, I, I, What's funny is is that. When I just saw Alien on its own as my first film, there is something uh, so frightening about when it's down to uh, Sigourney Weaver, or I'm going to start using character names, when it's down to Ripley, Lambert and Parker and they've decided they're going to blow the ship up and they are going to make a run for it in the shuttle because they, they've destroyed Ash. They know the company doesn't care about them. Uh, two of their crewmates are three of their crewmates are dead. Wait. Yeah. Three of their crewmates are dead. And and that's it. They, they, there's just there's no reason to hang in. They 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 know they're just biding time until it comes for them, and and even though Parker's got a flamethrower and and Ripley's got a flamethrower and they should be able to defend themselves, uh, they split up, and Ripley's setting the self destruct while they're packing up the gear, and. And the alien shows up and it's 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 just such a creepy moment. And and the way that they structure that so that over the inner ship comms, Ripley's hearing them as they're fighting off and losing, and Ripley's already set the bomb. I mean the the, the ship's gonna blow up. And and it, it's just a moment where the hopelessness escalates and, and, and you're invested in these three characters and two of them are helpless. And, and maybe that's also a catalyzing moment for Ripley as the hero, because if two people with a flamethrower couldn't repel this thing, how is she going to do it? What, what difference is she going to make? But she runs head first into it. Even listening to this horror unfold over the ship's intercom. 
and and right. it's very it's very kinetic and it, it, it's a it's a great scene. Um, I used to think the ending was really the best part when it reveals itself on the the shuttle. Uh, because I love the the twist of I mean she's so out of it that she doesn't even realize it's it's tucked itself into the corner. And as it slowly reveals itself and then takes, you know, takes its time working across the room and, and she's got that crazy helmet on and she can't see how close it is. And then it gets right up on her. Um, and that's another place where, because I have seen the movie as many times as I have, it, it doesn't make any sense. Unless the alien is a, a serial killer who's having fun with it. Right. I mean, it definitely changes at that point, right, from just kind of an animalistic predator to something that's enjoying this moment. Plus, of course, how does it know where the shuttlecraft is and what that's all about and all that kind of jazz? But well, passing over that part of it, uh, yeah, it, it seems to be showing kind of a malicious joy in this its final victim. Right. And, and I've heard everything, like, I've heard everything from... It knew what it was doing all along, and the aliens uh, are mildly telepathic, and and it's it's toying with her. I've read stuff where apparently at different panels, Ridley Scott and Scorny Weaver had thrown out ideas that were rejected, like the final shot is Ripley and the alien kiss, which weirdly enough comes back in Alien Resurrection. That's the one that Jean-Pierre Junet made, right? With the Joss Whedon script? I believe so. Yeah. Uh, where there's there's a whole moment where Ripley's kind of rolling around in the aliens uh, on the, the hybrid queen's uh, womb. <laughs> uh, forget that part. And then there was another, like Ridley Scott would have thought it was would have been cool if after killing Ripley... The alien had picked up the cat, sat down, and started completing Ripley's log in Sigourney Weaver's voice. Which I think would have been silly. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem, I don't know how that would have made any sense at all. Well. But but it might have explained why the alien, if you want to talk about how the alien was getting around the ship, like it knew the ship. Something like that might explain how, how it had that ability. Yeah. And and that would have played more to this whole time I was I being the alien was 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 hurting everyone so that I could get a shuttlecraft because there was no way I was going to operate a uh, a whole refinery in space. Although, again, considering that the alien seems to have a limitless lifespan, it would be better to hide out on that thing and just get to Earth. And yeah, that, that gets, so was there? Did it have a a, a autopilot? If they had all died, presumably it did, would they it did have, have gone home. It did have an autopilot because w- one of the issues is is they they they're brought out of hypersleep way too early. There isn't enough food on the ship for them to stay awake because that that's one of the problems in the film is that they they can't just siege up in operations. And and wait, um, because there isn't enough to sustain them. And I, at one point, I actually did dig out one. I, I read a couple of different drafts of the screenplay, and there is a version of the screenplay where they they make a point of having a scene where it's not unlike the the scene in Aliens where they they build a, a fort within the uh, the colony and and they're trying to seal everything and they go to get the food and the alien has already eaten all the food and in the film they try to use that to both rationalize how it got big so fa- uh, in the screenplay they try to rationalize this is how it got big so fast but it's also that it it knew it knew enough to go eat our food so that we couldn't just seal ourselves up 
Yeah, so. I mean, it's interesting. I, I think if the, I mean, I don't know, I tend to think that what we see from the alien for the most part, except for these moments, is that it's an, an animal type creature. Um, it would have been neat if they'd had some of that. I know in other conversations we had about, you know, whether they would have had the alien, you know, access something or do something to kind of show that it was more intelligent, at least an alien. I don't know if an alien or some of the other ones it does, but it well, seems an like it's pretty animal until the end, and then it becomes sort of gleeful. In aliens, they know how to cut the power, and that's that is definitely a higher function. Uh, because the thing where they they can just keep throwing their numbers at the auto guns doesn't seem very smart. Unless it's self-sacrifice for the queen to get, like, once there's a queen, the drones just will willingly throw their lives away to get to the peoples. Um, the math just doesn't work on that because there's there's ostensibly less people to make more drones in that room than there are drones being killed trying to get into the room. But that's applying way too much math to a summer blockbuster. Perhaps. Um, do you have a favorite scene from Alien? Um, I mean, you know, when it's uh, the whole face hugger and then it coming out of the chest are pretty cool. Uh, I mean, the whole bit with the face hugger, just the, the, the slow way the, the egg opens with the kind of the, the petals of the opening kind of opening up this that whole sequence i thought was thought was just um i guess uh riveting and then when it you know when the thing pops out of the chest though it's hard for me to separate it from space balls when it does a little song and dance at the diner at this point um huh. i always just haven't put those two together now you know but uh yeah I, I, those were pretty really strong strong moments for me of course all the stuff that you see in the I don't know, the kind of uh, the, sh- the the iconic shots are great, but the, those always kind of stuck out to me. I I think when I I watch the the part where Kane is initially infected, um, yeah, uh, it, it's that it's like that thing where if you ever got sick on vacation, you know, the, he he's he's stuck inside this giant alien ship, and there's this this feeling of dread like is he even going to make it back to the ship the first time you're watching it and of course he's got to make it back to the ship because they have to get back into space and all this other you know horror has to unfold but uh yeah i mean there's that's actually one of the worst moments for anybody because it's it's terrible to have something that foreign happen in a place unfamiliar (laughs) And plus, you know, like we were saying before, they had, unlike in the other movies, they had done everything the right way, right? I mean, you can't fault the guy for wanting to look inside that egg. I mean, yeah, you might be saying, oh, gosh, don't do it. But, you know, he's got his helmet on. He's taking all the precautions he can. Yes. Yes. It's not It's not like in Covenant when they straight up without any facial protection and all buried their faces in, uh, in the uh, postules or whatever and straight up inhale uh, foreign antibodies that turn into monsters in their bloodstream. <laughs> right. Um, no. So yeah, I, I, Alien is... I go back and forth because I, I also think Aliens is a fantastic movie and, and I don't... I don't think that James Cameron wrote anybody's coattails because in a lot of ways he he invented so many great new ways to make it scary. But I, I do think that as far as the characters go, the characters in Alien is are superior. In Aliens you get kind of the like they're fun and they're quotable, but those a lot of those marine characters are just kind of goofs. You know, they're just so they're, oh, well, yeah, they're, and I'm, they're more kind of stereotypes than any kind of well rounded sort of character. They, uh, there, there are definitely a bunch of them are disposable, but then, then you get 
uh, charming moments, like how in the beginning Vasquez has no no use for Gorman because he's never actually served in combat, and and then in in, in the the epic run for the the evac when Vasquez. Vasquez is doomed, and Gorman goes back to to die with her. Uh, that, that that's there. There are some wonderful action movie moments, and and I. Oh no doubt! I'm not trying to say that there aren't. I'm I don't think there's there anything as touching in Alien as the the relationship that forms between Newt and Ripley. Um, and and to that effect, a, Aliens it gave me things to care about. Like at the end of Alien. I'm really just interested in Ripley getting away and surviving. But I don't... And that, that that's part of the, the genius of when Alien was on its own is Alien doesn't give you a happy ending. She doesn't know if she's going to be rescued. And the ship suffered damage repelling a giant acid-filled monster. Uh, and I love that. It was a bold move. Very much so. I, I do think that aliens, I guess I give a little bit of short shrift to the newt thing just because it's kind of that obvious thing of this strong female character and it's kind of the, like the, oh, it's the mother instinct. And I kind of like that they didn't have that in alien. That they, well, that and they, that could... they didn't try to like to pull that particular string because it's kind of the obvious string to pull with a female protagonist is to bring in a child for her to, you know, bond with. So yeah. I almost I, I feel like yes in aliens they, is that relationship, but there's that part of me that goes like that's ah, just a little kind of cheesy. Well, um, when when I first saw the first full trailer for Prometheus, um, my secret hope was that the the twist was going to be um, that Numi Rapace's character uh, to survive because because you saw the engineers in in the trailer and you saw that horrible things were happening to people and then they were being turned into something else. And, and they tipped you off that the engineers had every intention of going to earth. And and what I thought would have been a great twist would have been if to stop the engineers from getting to earth, uh, if, if Shaw knew me replaces character had had to consume whatever the black goo was and that had turned her into the queen alien well, that would have been and, and so you know, the ship crashes. She she starts her hive um, because by this point she's she has become to help humanity. She has become a monster herself, and and then what a layer that would have added to the horror of going back and watching Aliens is that Sigourney Weaver is actually fighting Shaw. And and what you act because that's what they kind of get into is it, it's a mom fight at the end of Aliens. Don't mess with my kids, right? And uh, if I felt that was something Prometheus could have have done with the story that would have added a little more weight to the prequel. But it didn't, and and I don't have enough time. We're not talking about movies we didn't like. We're talking about horror movies we really did like, and that's <laughs> that's why. What's funny is Alien happens, and then we get to summer of nineteen eighty two, and we we've got our our Wookies, and we've got. Uh, E.T. and we've got our Mork's Mork was on right at that point, right? Uh, was it still on in E2? Possibly, but there was other. I mean, if it wasn't that, there was something else. We um, had a lot of aliens we loved. We had close encounters. We had we had plenty of aliens that meant us no harm. Yes. And, and then John Carpenter um, remakes the thing from another world more faithfully to the source material who goes there, uh, which have you ever read that? I have not read it. Have you? 
Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I, have you ever seen the thing from another world? Uh, a long time ago, but yeah, I have seen it. It's it's pretty bad, I think, honestly. Oh, I think it's it's a great piece of classic, you know, Hollywood horror. But it, I mean, it it's is very a- much of its age. It feels very pretty schlocky. Um, and kind of goofy, but yeah, I guess it fits in the same framework as those other kind of fifties horror films. Yeah, I, I I respect what they did at the time with where things were at. But yeah, it is very much a a big scary guy in a suit. Yeah, I mean it's like a Frankenstein monster type creature. Yes, um, he's, got, not, he's got not the... a, I mean maybe it was because I don't know where it came out in relation to say the original invasion of the body snatchers, but it's certainly not not exactly pushing the envelope as far as uh it seems like in of, of kind of creature design. It seems more like how could we take this <laughs> Frankenstein's monster and put it in space? Or, or, or give it a or, sci-fi or, edge. Give it a sci-fi edge. Bring it to the Arctic. Um, it, it's. I think for me, it's more about how it's shot, uh, the pacing in it. But who goes there is is frightening, and and it 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 plays much more heavily into the paranoia. And since it is a creature that can shape shift and look like people and you, you have a lot of the key beats from the thing in there, uh, the, the blood testing scene. Uh, one interesting choice. There is a, a key moment in the, the short story where uh, when, when they are going to have the, Final showdown with the thing in Who Goes There. Uh, they they spot an albatross flying through the sky, and they they shoot it out of the sky because they're worried the thing will absorb it and figure out how to fly away. And 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 it was in reading that, and I I didn't read that until years after I had seen John Carpenter's The Thing. It did occur to me that thing the thing never tries to fly. No, it, it does not. It spends the better part of the movie secretly building a flying saucer. And that's that's in the book too, because when they finally get to the shack, it's built basically a rocket pack or an anti gravity pack. And uh, they they chase it out in the snow and and basically systematically burn it piece to piece and kill it and, and it's dead and they they worry about things like oh gosh what if it had actually gotten this thing working or what if it had seen the albatross and figured out how to fly uh, but I love everything about John Carpenter's The Thing. I, I, I love I love the opening where McReady is playing chess with the computer and he's losing and he cheats. Uh, I, I love it's kind of it's 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 right there in the peak synergy between Carpenter and Kurt Russell. Absolutely, uh, it's a fantastic cast it's one of those times where they actually gave Carpenter a lot of money and time to play with. Uh, and, and I, I think in. Well, I think one of the things I think in both these movies that they do really well is they are able to utilize some of the horror tropes in ways that make sense, right? We have the isolation either because they're an Arctic base or they're in space and it makes sense. It's not like when you're in a, a, uh, a camp where you think like, why don't they just hitchhike on the road and get the heck out of there? Like they're stuck. Right. Right. I mean, in the camp movies, somebody always cuts a phone line or smash. Yeah. But you always feel like, you know, you could just walk to town. Like the town's right there. Like these places, they really are isolated in a way that you understand that they are. And they play with that. Like they are absolutely isolated. You dang, there's, there's only, you know, limited ways to escape off that ship. There's really no way to escape from that. Um, Arctic. Well, I mean, I guess the helicopter, but then the helicopter gets 
uh, taken out of commission so that there's there's no way out, you know, and so they are able to really, I think, well, make use of those in ways that you don't if you have to turn your brains off to appreciate that, OK, they're trapped in these locations with this horrible creature that's out to destroy them. Well, and and this is where the thing is, both as a movie and as a character, I, I think so much more interesting than the alien it definitely doesn't look as cool. And part of that is because it never looks the same. And and it, if the presence of the alien makes you feel kind of like gross that this thing is in here and, and is gradually corrupting your space, uh, the thing is, the thing is like finding out you have a tumor. Uh, and that that tumor can and will live on without you. Can will live on that, and, and that's the thing is disgusting. And, and Rob Bottin, who did uh, who who did this, and, and and also RoboCop, did some incredible creature design and effects back in the eighties, and and things like the head crab um, are just iconic. Yeah, and that really is a gross, amazing thing with the head that the the neck sort of stretching that that's making that noise and the mouth, everything's just kind of pulling, and then it just sort of sloughs off the table and grows those legs. It's just well, super gross, super creepy. Um, I'm trying to remember: is it Fuchs or Nulls? Is it? Uh, I forget which one. Whoever which one is on the table. And the head comes popping off. I mean, I was just watching it. I was just that like, was um that oh gosh, that's just such a great scene because even though I don't, it's not necessarily scary to me at this point. It's just so just kind of gross. But Bennings, almost ben, Bennings is the one I think hypnotizing. where he, he goes out into the they they catch him. I think Knowles catches him. Somebody catches him. The thing assimilating somebody where you, you basically see the tendrils going into the guy as the blood is draining out of him. And those tendrils, by the way, is another kind of good effect, even though it's just, I don't know, like silly string, just kind of whipping around. It really, it yeah, really it, gives it this kind of really creepy vibe. Like it's just trying to find something to latch onto and just suck into. Yeah. For anyone listening, I'm sorry. Earlier I, I had all my names straight, but. Uh, I'm terrible with the name. So you're still one up on me. And I just watched it today. Uh, yeah, because it's it's it's. I'm, oh gosh. But yeah, the thing is not the thing is not a cool creature in the way that people could think of alien as a cool creature. It is this just mess hodgepodge. I think the interesting thing too is that it's it's bending. Like watching the I just watching the blood test again, where it's it seems like people aren't even sure if they're the thing or not because they're doing the blood test. You see them getting relieved that they're not the thing. And it's almost like you wonder, it's like, do you not know you're the thing until you get outed and it kind of activates? Like, how do you not know? Because you see them like, oh, your blood's not the thing. And then you kind of, you see them go like, whew. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Didn't you know you weren't the thing? The, um, which in is the original s- story, when they do that scene, I and mean, what's hilarious is more than 10 of them are the thing. And they just keep having to burn people. Uh, it, it's it's the the movie benefits by paring down the cast. Uh, it, well, even where where uh, uh, oh gosh, the guy who's in charge of the dogs makes the rush at that McGreedy, her. right? And, and and he turns out to have been human, and McGreedy has to just burn him down or. It was just shoots him in the head. Shoots him, shoots um, him, and then and then the other guy's like, yeah, "That's a murder on you, McGrady. You'll swing for that." Yeah, and, Child, and that, Childs yeah. calls him out on on the murder, but the guy was gonna gut him. So you know, what choice did he have? Right, and, and it, as much as uh, John Carpenter found uh, a friend and an ally and a collaborator in Kurt Russell. Uh, he equally found one in Keith David uh, because Keith David is equally a great thing about this movie and he's also great and they live. Oh, yes. 
which we'll have to do in another one. But yeah, he's he he plays a great foil to McCready, another logical voice, but one that doesn't agree, so that you have this reason to doubt what McCready's doing, or at least you know puts that little worm in the back of your mind that is is McCready really trustworthy? Does he know what he's talking about, or is he wrong? Because Childs also seems to know what he's talking about and doesn't panic and doesn't do stupid things. Well, there are fantastic moments. I mean, when McCready hold, you know, gets locked out to freeze because they found his clothes shredded and that had previously been an indication of who'd been assimilated. And then he, he forces his way back in with a stick of dynamite threatening to blow everybody up. Uh, right, leading leading up to the blood test. And again, it just shows, you know, I like the kind of tit for tat, right? Because they're learning from what they see. They're not just scares or gross moments, but the fact that that whole head growing legs and trying to get away gives McCready this idea that the bits of the thing are going to try to self-preserve, and so you can do a blood test. Well, and that also, part of what's interesting about the thing is it's, is the magic trick is you're you're thinking about these as one on one fights, and what you don't realize through most of the movie is is that even even though Wilford Brimley's uh, character Blair is supposed to be locked in isolation for his own good because he he goes crazy early in the film and destroys uh, the the radio and well of course the question is is he crazy is he the thing or is he actually doing something very smart which is trying to isolate them so that the thing can't get out yeah and that you i i still i've watched it enough times i don't know when blair is turned but it's interesting in that blair is the one who first calls out what the thing is when he's doing the autopsy on the the creature that they find up over at the Thule station. And he also tries to isolate himself. He tries to get himself, you know, when they find his notes and he's basically had figured out that somebody, there's a high probability that somebody or one of them is a thing. He does the smart thing, which is basically try to get away from everybody as much as you can on an Arctic base. Right. But since the thing the thing doesn't have to be the thing doesn't have to be any one place at any one time you know chunks of like a part of one of the dogs that got away could easily assimilate blair yes yeah, so, well i mean that's what makes it so scary is right because what can you count on you can't really you can't count on anything because yeah you it, it's not a singular being if there's any piece that gets away that has that kind of self-awareness it could then spawn more things and i think what's even scarier about the thing is it it imme- well it knows how to speak as us it's easy it's easy to uh, it's able to easily p- pretend to be part of the community uh, it's obviously smart enough to build a flying saucer and and I don't know like the alien in aliens is just there to destroy and because they cut out the scene with the hive we don't even know if it's their breed you know it 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 just Every step of that movie is kill, 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 destroy, destroy, destroy. It, it, it is right. It is on par with a, a Jason Voorhees. It, it is simply there to wreak havoc, and and it's whereas the thing, I, I've I've pulled back at points and thought this is a creature that crash landed on Earth, and and it wants to survive. It didn't land here. It didn't come here on its own. It's been stuck for a really long time. And 
I don't even know that the assimilation of everyone is its goal. I mean, we really know nothing about it. I mean, we don't even know if you want to go just kind of, I mean, I don't know what the short story said, but, or the novella, but we don't even know if it wasn't hitching a ride on the thing that crashed, crash landing here, or if that was its own ship. I mean, we don't, we know it came on the ship and we know that it arrived somehow on the ship, but if it's like a rat or like a cockroach, right, that hitch rides on ships and get around, but they're not the drivers of the ships. Um, and they, and they give it motives that we don't know if it really had we yeah we don't know if it was going to assimilate things i think again going back to that kind of it makes good excuses for the horror tropes whereas an alien if you think about well how does the alien know to go to these parts of the ships or be there we have to kind of invent reasons for it with the with the thing given that is assimilating people once it assimilates a human and we understand that it can pretend to be there, it gets, seems to get their memories and stuff, then now we understand how it's able to move around and be undercover and do those things that in, or, uh, in other horror situations we just sort of have to just kind of shrug and just say, well, it's a movie. That's why Jason Voorhees knows how to how, this person's apartment better than the people who live there do. But with the, the thing assimilates something that lives in that apartment, you know, in this case lives on the base, then it gives us that backstop of okay this is why it knows how to get there this is why it knows what's going on because it assimilated that person which i always appreciated yeah i i guess one one thing i've always wondered is is that why the thing plays coy for as long as it does like does it does it not have the strength or mass to take on five guys at a time well, I mean, once I, I guess though it's got the flamethrowers, right? So it's kind of a zero sum game, right? It, it's if, if they if, if it tries to do it and it fails, it's flamed out and it's toast. So I feel like Koi is the safest place to go, or at least to kind of spread yourself around and get as much of you out there as possible. And then depending on what its motives are, does it really want to get rid of everybody, or does it want to just convince everybody that it's gone and so that it can get back to civilization or get whatever it needs to get out of there it seems like it's game if it's trying to escape then it would want to finish its flying saucer thing and get out and do that undisturbed if it is trying to assimilate then it want to get it wants to get to civilization the easiest ways for that to happen are really not for it to destroy everybody and risk getting take that high risk that it's going to get destroyed in turn just to lay low keep spreading around thingness Maybe everybody, you know, maybe get everybody to become things or just kind of lay low and finish whatever it is it's trying to do. Um, I'm, I feel like it, the high risk reward of particularly in groups trying to just take out everybody, it's too much. And, and again, they play it smart, right? When the dogs start going crazy, they come out to shoot and kill them. Like they're not messing around, which I really appreciated, especially watching it again. It's like, it's not one of these things where the dogs are barking and some guy goes out there with nothing and like, oh, what's going on? Right, they they come out there and they take the threat seriously from jump. Right, and no and, one no one know. ever gives a a big speech about this is a, a a rare life form and we need to preserve this. Um, I mean, yeah, they talk about it once they think it's dead. They do talk about oh, someone's going to get a Nobel Prize for this, but that's when it's dead. They're not talking about we need to keep some of it alive or whatnot. Um, they only realize that it's not all the way dead. It's just you know uh, mostly dead in uh, Princess Bride Parley parlance because they get the notes and that's where they find out that Wilfred Brimley uh, had discovered that it is not, that, that there's, the cells still had some life left in them. It wasn't a complete corpse. Yeah. Yeah. And what's funny is I don't think you've ever watched the prequel. I have not. Yeah. Uh, part of the fun of the film is not knowing what went down at the Thule station. Uh, yeah. And, and and even just culturally, I mean, we see a, a husky run into a camp and, you know, guys chasing it with rifles and, you know, something clearly seems black and white, right? Like, like the guys with the rifles are the bad guys and here's this poor dog. Yeah, and I'll tell you, those guys are some horrible shots with those shots with those rifles because they had a lot of shots at it when she's running across the, the the Arctic plain, and they're not even they don't even get a, a not even a, a grazing shot on it, and then they do the big oopsie with the grenade, right? Um, pretty pretty kind of comical there in, in a sense, but yeah, I mean, you know, the Norwegians, you just see the dog running, and yeah, you don't know what to make of it, and they don't. 
because they're not they don't say much and they're not speaking in English. Um, <laughs> you don't have a sense of what they're saying. They don't try to t- communicate to the base, to the U.S. base, and tell them what's happening. Maybe they didn't know where they were, the direction it was, or maybe likely they don't think that anybody would believe them if they told them. And um, I will say in the prequel, that is one of the things they handle really well is, is explaining why those guys are just beyond explaining themselves or being reasonable by that point. All right. So just out of curiosity, what is the reasoning in the, well, the one guy has done everything to stay alive uh, and, and survive the night. And then he sees his own dog had died earlier in the film. And when he sees the thing taken off and the helicopter pilot, you know, returns from being gone for the whole ordeal. He's like, we got to go, we got to go, we got to go. And there's an urgency to killing that dog before it makes it to the American base and gets more. But I mean, do they explain why they don't try to contact the American base? You know, send out a radio signal. I know the cover story, like the dog is diseased. It's got you know, mega rabies. No, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure the thing is smart enough to destroy the radio early in the film. Okay. Uh, and there might have been something about, like, I thought there might have been something, because they're the ones who uncover the flying saucer, and, and you know, they're they're trying to keep that fine secret. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like there's a space for, again, just thinking real life of the dog's got a disease. You gotta get rid. Of it. I mean, that's the two thousand one thing, right? So in two thousand one, when the, you know, when what's his name it goes up to see the uh, obelisk on the moon, you know, there had been this cover story by the government that the moon had there was some kind of virus at the U.S. base, and that's why that the Russian astronauts couldn't land there. And that's why it was all hush hush. So I imagine they could have said something similar, um, but it's not a huge thing because it's just kind of the beginning of the movie. But it is one of those things, if you want to look at something that might have been like, well, why didn't they reach out? It's such a desperate measure. At some point, you think it's more important than the secrecy or you, again, you give an excuse, you know, but it's possible they just didn't speak English. And so they just. Well, it's established that character doesn't um, and needs other people to translate back and forth for him. Yeah, which totally makes sense. I mean, it seems pretty clear that all these different stations are operating very independently and they make a point in the movie of saying how there's you know, that it's, it's not weird that they can't get through to anybody because nobody can get through to anybody. They're all pretty much on their own. Right. Um, the only frustrating thing about the, the thing as a character, as a creature, is uh, when between the Blair monster, which is the, the head crab, the big giant mouth midsection, it and then the yeah you know, the the chimera type creature it turns into for the the final showdown with McCready. If it could do that, why didn't it do that earlier? <laughs> well, I think its goals change. You know, it goes from uh, it's like you have Plan A, Plan B, Plan C. I don't think it's was necessarily the thing that it wanted to do because now when it's doing that sort of thing it is definitely out at itself right but i think it, it gotten down to it where it was now a, like me or him kind of proposition as opposed to like i can no longer lay low and get by so i have to escalate it's at least how i how i thought of it because I, I think it does seem to show like the creature does kind of change its tactics well i could see it's it's mad at as it's moving right? along it's mad well, I mean, yeah but, you know, uh, it doesn't do itself any favors by having a big, you know, a boss fight with him in the end. Uh, well, I think mean, it's like, you know, you're trying one last thing. I mean, r- remember, like, McGrady was about to blow the whole thing up, right? So it had to make a big move. I feel like McGrady was trying to kind of goad it, too, when I'm watching that scene where he's really, like... I feel like he's like making sure that if there's the thing is in earshot, it can hear him priming the the dynamite and you know get, priming the the plunger. And I feel like it kind of forces it to come big at him because maybe he's also looking for that single, you know, one one single uh, combat to to finish it. 
Uh, so, and yeah, there's the big boss fight that that blows up the base. Do you and think... Then the, the famous end with Childs. Right, and we, we never see what happens to Nalls, right? He just disappears. Uh, yeah, one of them gets taken out, though. Wilford Brimley yeah, grabs him by the face and then just kind of face melts with him and drags him off. And then, yeah, you don't see what happens to Nalls. He's just gone. Then, yeah, then uh, then there's the boss fight. The base explodes. And then you have... And they lose child, child in the storm, him. right? Right, but one of them th- says they think they see Childs doing something, and then the power goes out. And the idea is that Childs killed the generator, suggesting that Childs is a thing. If that guy saw correctly, and I think you do. I think you do. I think they show like a, a like a somewhat of a close up of Childs showing he's out there, but you don't. Obviously, they don't show him pulling the. You know, it's kind of like these events happen in order. You see Childs; he's outside. He's kind of moving off. Then the power goes out, but we don't see Childs pull the power, so we don't know for sure that he did, but he's in a position where he could have. Okay, but of so, course, the Wilfred thing was out there. There's other things that were out there that could have done it as well. That's why it leaves it open to when Childs shows up at the very end. We can't be totally sure that, oh yeah, he's the thing. We don't know. Did you feel at all denied that we didn't have a moment where Wilfred Brimley turned into some spooky, crazy monster? Uh, I don't remember he turns into one, but I mean, he does, he does do, like thingish. Yeah, but he does like put his hand into the guy's mouth, right? And kind of mess around, and then you pull, and then you see him dragging the guy by like his mouth and his arm sort of fuse into one thing. Yes, and sort of drags him off. That's as close as we get, but that seems to pretty much definitively show him as a thing, um, right? But no, he doesn't I mean... go. Yeah, he doesn't have some kind of crazy like stuff doesn't explode out of him. He doesn't go all tentacle crazy or anything like that. Yeah, we don't we don't have the big you know mustache twirler moment. No. Um, uh, so yeah, and then so and and I guess we don't know for sure if he's blown up, but I guess we assume that he's the tentacles that come out and that you know that he is blown up, which leaves just Childs at the end with McCready. Well, doesn't the monster ingest it? Eats the detonator, right? I mean, it grabs it with a tentacle and pulls it down the plunger. Uh, right. But I think McCready uses dynamite or something else to. Get around the uh, cause the, the chain reaction. He has yeah. no, cause the chain reaction that blows everything up. Uh, okay, so and and our climax is is that it's it's McCready and Childs, and they're going they're going to freeze to death. Right, and there's they have a bottle of uh, what is it? Uh, what alcohol is it? I forget. I think it's um, whiskey. Yeah, some bread JB. I think it's like J and B or I think whiskey, something like that. It's whiskey, and, but uh, what's interesting is is people have pointed out that that McCready is walking around with Molotov cocktails, right? They, and, right, but there's not that connective bit of scene that shows him actually making that into a Molotov cocktail. So it's really, but they do show um, when he's setting up the plunger, detonating everything. They show him have other bottles that he has made Molotov cocktails, but there's no definitive moment that shows him making that bottle into one, right? But, but but there is definitely a thing where where Childs drinks swigs out of the bottle and McCready smiles and kind of chuckles, right? And the feeling there is is that if McCready if it was a Molotov cocktail, then Childs just drank gasoline, behaved like it was alcohol, and has tipped his hat. Right, that's the idea. But you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we could probably come up with a hundred things why he reacts the way he does. Maybe it's just kind of a chuckle. I don't know. Has anyone else drank out of that bottle the entire time that he's had it? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he just hasn't shared it before. Maybe. I don't know. But yeah, it, it, it's definitely I mean, it could just be the possibility. It could just be the absurdity of I'm going to die with the guy who hates me the most in the camp. Yeah, we're going to share a drink as like, the camp is burning down. And uh, yeah, then we're going to freeze, freeze together. So yeah, I mean... And it could have all been for naught because if Childs is the thing, then freezing isn't going to kill him. It's only going to preserve him until the, the rescue comes and and this nightmare starts all over again. Right. Uh, and one thing I really... Now, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. One, one thing I appreciate, you know, it's like when Ridley Scott says, oh, Deckard is a replicant or somebody tells you 
if, if John Carpenter had come back and said, oh, yeah, no, Childs is the thing, and uh, they, he gets rescued and, and Earth is consumed in four days, uh, we don't have that. It, it's still hanging out there, you know. Though I think I think someone said, or, or I saw this on somewhere, that John Carpenter did come out and say that one of the two is a thing. Um, in his conception, uh, maybe I should try to find the quote, but apparently that is out there that he has floated that one of them is a thing, but he has not said which. But you know, again, I hated the Ridley Scott bit and it, um, the whole replicant thing and how he kind of added tacked that onto his director's cut. So I don't necessarily give extra stock to that if because who knows if Carpenter thought of that during the filming, if that was actually integral to the process or he just decided in his brain afterwards. Uh, I definitely like that it's open ended as to one or more of them. Um, I know. Have you heard the whole eye shine bit with the people who are not the th- not things have that bit of eye uh, reflection, kind of that that I forget they call what they call it, where they sort of put that little spotlighting to make a little shimmer in the eye. Oh, really? Gleam. Yeah. Apparently, if you go back and look in the in particularly the blood testing is a big one where the humans have that little bit that little spotlighting in the in their eyes, but. Um, Whichever, what's his name, who becomes, who who things out at that point, his eyes don't have that. And Childs doesn't have that at the end. But then I also heard that the guy who came up with that subtle effect, that Carpenter told him not to do it in the last scene. But in the last scene, and who knows what's right, what's wrong, what's just rumor, but McCready has that little, the little uh, highlights in his eyes, and Childs doesn't. Interesting. I mean, I've heard the whole thing about how clothes change color. Once you've been assimilated, because like Blair's shirt is yellow when he's Blair, and then it's white when he's not. Yeah, and someone said that that made sense. They made a good point. This might have been because I did rewatch some of the Red Letter Media's um, their uh, review of it, uh, and uh, they said I think it might have been them because I watched something else also to uh, get caught up on the kind of fan theories and whatnot. But you know the the thing. Uh, transforming is very messy yeah so if you were wearing a yellow shirt and you got assimilated chances are when it you know the thing takes on your form that yellow shirt is trashed so you have to take a new got to change your clothes so it makes sense then that if he was wearing a yellow shirt he gets killed he gets assimilated that thing takes over his form that yeah he's not that yellow shirt's not gonna be in any shape to wear so then you got to get a different shirt. So it, it definitely something to go through and look. And I think they mentioned that Childs changes his clothes at some point in there. Um, I mean, I imagine and Childs makes the most sense as being the alien, but it doesn't mean that if, if one of them has to be the thing, Childs makes the most sense the way the film is. But there are definitely enough gaps that you could see McCready being a thing or both of them could be a thing. Because it seems like you could have multiple versions that are out for themselves. Because the one thing is that these different body parts all seem to get separated and just act for themselves. You know, McCready's hypothesis that you could have two versions of the thing that aren't working together. Or working even, separately towards yeah. the common goals, yeah. They may not even know that each other are the thing. They're just out for their survival. Or they have that goal they have in common that they share from their parent thing. Um, but that they're no longer aware of each other. They don't have that physical connection so they're they could be working at cross purposes which would be a really kind of fascinating concept if you had multiple things and they were all didn't realize they were things or at least didn't realize that they're the other ones were things and so we're essentially each one trying to be the sole survivor yeah i have you ever played the first halo game yes yeah i always felt like the flood uh was highly derivative from the thing I mean, it's got both thing and alien, right? Because it's got those kind of face huggery sort of. It's what got they got pods that that burrow into you and turn you into a part of the greater mass. But then uh, there's that that horrible moment where uh, you're fighting through the the Covenant's giant ship that they've taken over in the first game, and, and Cortana asks the Master Chief, you know, why are they piling bodies on the floor? And it's clear that they're they're building in something larger, and it isn't until Halo Two that you find out that the the goal of that is to 
to amass enough minds so that you come up with a super mind and a super creature. And and that's kind of what I felt like the thing was working towards was it it could based on things like when Blair does fuse into the guy's face, uh, it it could it could make a bigger monster if it had enough people. I mean, it seems like that the the the, the final Blair form does get quite large before it gets blown up. So there could be some similarity there. Um, yeah, yeah, just like calling everything home for the big. Yeah, absolutely. So tr- let's try to wrap things up here. Uh, you have any? What is your favorite? Do you have any favorite uh, thing moments? You got any favorite scenes or just bits that you really like? I, I mean, from from the minute that McReady gets back into the base to when. It's 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 not unlike my favorite sequence. It's an alien uh, to the point where they're doing because because all these the Greedy gets back into the base. I keep saying the Blair monster. It's not the Blair monster. It's um, gosh, who 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 splits into the two mo- monsters? Oh boy, the, just the one that happens during the blood test. You mean or the one before? Yeah, who who turns? Uh, I, like I said, I'm I'm terrible at the. Who turns into the head crab? Norris. Norris is the one who turns into the the head head monster. That whole sequence happens during the blood test, right? Mm, That one happens before the blood test. During the blood test is when the guy with the head splits open and makes a giant mouth. And then kills copper. Kills windows. Uh, Kills windows, yeah. Uh, Yeah, that's the one that, like, yeah, its head becomes like a mouth. Um, before that, I think before McCready gets locked outside is when they, they're doing that. Maybe it's another autopsy and they have to flame the body and the head starts to kind of scream and the neck just sort of elongates and then just kind of separates. It's really, it's just a great effect. I mean, that practical effect for that. Well, even because it has really that, that wonderful moment good. where the head's scurrying away and yeah, makes in the, the noise. In, in the background too, where you, you see them talking and you see the head just kind of on those arachnid legs just kind of scrambling out of the door and then it cuts to the guys looking and they're just kind of shocked at what they're seeing they just don't even quite believe it that the head is trying to sort of crawl away it's great this is totally a great moment but i, I always like the wilford brimley something about that character i mean just that actor that character a blair when he's in the isolation thing you know saying you know i'm okay i'd like to come back i'm okay i don't know why but that always became a very kind of quotable sort of in my own circle <laughs> talking about just kind of the meme of like saying that you're okay. You know, I'm okay now. I'm okay. I'd like to come back and join the rest of you. I'm okay. Yeah. So, so alien has had no shortage of now sequels and prequels. And I keep wondering if they're actually going to let Ridley Scott make one more to try to tie up what he was doing, or if they're just going to try to reboot the whole thing or I know Neil Blomkamp had, had talked about making one more movie with Sigourney Weaver that got shelved. There will be more Alien. They tried to make a prequel to the thing, and other than just servicing, getting from discovering the flying saucer to getting us to the opening of the thing, it doesn't. It doesn't do much. In fact, I guess they made them reshoot the ending of the film because it, it climaxes with uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead and um, Joel Edgerton uh, getting to chasing the creature back to the flying saucer. And they have a showdown there with the monster. And, and originally when they got to the flying saucer, I guess it was going to be revealed that the thing was like a zoo creature that they or a specimen or something that they kept on the ship that escaped. And then, and, and that very much the same thing unfolded on the ship where they, they ultimately crashed into earth during the prehistoric age to prevent the thing from getting back to their planet. And, and I'm, I'm glad they didn't do that because I, I, I don't think the whole savage creature that can't figure out how to repair its own ship 
would have worked with the whole idea of something that got scooped up off a planet. Well, I think if, I think the thing is though, right? If the idea is that it assimilates different creatures, if it assimilates an alien, then it and that knows how to create a ship, then it can then create a ship, right? The, uh, thing, with, the thing with the birds is, I think at least in the movie, they don't show any birds at all. Um, so it may have no concept of a bird, and so it looks at what does it know, which is mechanical flight. That's what it's seen. So that's what it tries uh, to do. Good point. Good you know? point. So I, I mean, I don't know if they thought about that stuff. But you know, maybe you know, and maybe if they assim- once they assimilate a human, it l- understands about birds and flying. But there are no birds around for it to assimilate anyway, so it doesn't have. It can't create wings. It seems like it can only copy what it assimilates. So it's got to find a bird to become a bird. So two questions, maybe three. Uh, do you ever imagine what happens beyond when the thing cuts to black? Uh, do you think McCready or Childs is the thing? And do you think anyone could ever come along with an idea and innovative enough that you would see a sequel to this movie? Uh, I could see a sequel to the movie, not because someone has been innovative enough, but just because there's enough room and that fade to black to think that it could survive in some way. And so someone will have some ideas. Maybe some star will want to put their name on it. Maybe the rock after they do big trouble, little child, <laughs> the rock, the rock will want to just go ahead and keep hitting out Kurt Russell, John Carpenter movies and, and do the thing. So certainly chance for it. I always thought that child's was, uh, was a thing, but I think just because, um, you know, I was just looking at it from Kurt Russell's point of view as the hero. But like I said, I think there's a lot of gray area where you could see him as a thing. You could see both of them or neither of them. It doesn't really ultimately matter because you have these two guys that, yeah, they can't trust each other till the end. And they're just both going to die together or freeze together, you know, having made a choice. But yeah, I could see them doing more of it just because someone will throw money at it and think that they can resuscitate the franchise and you know i mean look i i feel like anything that has a name attached to it whether they will someone will want to use that ip thinking they can generate money from it i mean i don't know i've seen we keep seeing people try to resuscitate these ips and i wonder what is the who really cares for like a starsky and hutch remake and yet they'll do it so i feel like the thing is in that same camp. Well, somebody will look at it, they'll want to do kind of a horror movie. Maybe someone will have seen a script that they feel like they can, they don't think is strong enough to stand on its own, but they think if they attach, you know, an existing IP, that'll give it the juice it needs. And they'll look at it and they'll say, Oh, we've got the thing. So let's, let's make it a thing movie. You know? So I can totally see it, but I don't think it needs it. I don't think I don't want it, but when has that stopped, you know, Hollywood before? What about you? What do you think? I fall into the category of, what I like to imagine is I, I like the idea uh, that the film ends the way it began, where McCready is playing chess with the thing, the whole movie in that last moment, it, it has maneuvered him into a position where he's, he's in checkmate. He's going to die. Uh, no, no one is going to show up and save him in time. And, and just like, yeah, he dumps the drink on the computer chess game. He uh, he he uses the the fake gesture of sharing a drink to determine if Childs is the thing. Uh, that the laugh is that he's actually figured out that Childs is the thing. And and I ha- I have to go back and rewatch it. I, I sorry I didn't before we, but I've heard people observe that that it looks like he's holding the flamethrower. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't like screen cap it or anything. It definitely seems like he's got something there. I mean, yes, I do love the idea that he gave him the alcohol or the gasoline, and then like after it goes to black, he's gonna hit the flamethrower since. Child's uh, drinking it and showing no uh, reaction to it does tell him that that is definitely the most kind of romantic, like, well, yeah, and the thing is now, moment. now the thing is full of gasoline. So it's just going to go up like a Roman candle. Um, right. But I like not knowing. And, and I like that because uh, the prequel which was made in 2011, follows a lot of the same beats. And and there's a moment where Mary Elizabeth Winstead and Joel Egerton, having both escaped 
the the fight with an aspect of the thing aboard the flying saucer. They get into the car and and the thing cannot replicate metal is one of the conceits. And so Yeah, I heard that. And there's a thing that says, well, Childs can't be a thing because they show his earring. But I, I don't know. I'm not gonna and, apply stuff that they decided to do many, many years after right, the original movie. Right. Now and, applying to the original and Joe Egerton's earring isn't in his ear and he says, Oh, it fell out and he points to uh the hole and she says, No, it's in the wrong ear, which I guess what I don't like about that is is that when Bennings, the guy who runs out into the snow because he gets caught, the Bennings monster gets caught assimilating Bennings, and he's the one who, I mean, he's got the big, giant, crazy hands, and, and he lets out the, oh, before they burn him. Like, all all the thing posters with the, the monster in the park are kind of loosely based off of what they do with Bennings in that scene, or the Bennings monster. And... He's running with the limp that Benning has got when he was wounded earlier in the film. And if you're you're talking about a monster that copies people exactly, why would the earring be in the wrong ear? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess the idea would be that, yeah, if, I mean, assuming it couldn't copy that, that it somehow made that goof. But yeah, it's one of those things that, I mean, I just think the prequel, having not seen it, you know, I just, from what I understand, it's just not as tight. No, it's and, just and sloppy, you know, with we're... some of those prot goofs to kind of, she has to figure out a way to determine that he's a thing. So that's what it is, even though it doesn't make a ton of sense, given what we should know about the thing's capabilities at and, that point. And she tearfully, because she actually liked Joel Edgerton's character, says, I'm sorry, it has to set him on fire. And then it lets out a, an inhuman scream as it burns. And so that one, it's definitive. There's other than the Husky back at the base, there, there are no other rogue things. And, and it goes back to part of what makes it neck and neck for me in so many ways with alien is, is I like not knowing that that's, that is a case where I, I am completely fine that the filmmaker said, no, you decide because there are there are enough pieces, and I I I, I still haven't decided because I like I like how when something effectively scares me, I like it, and and that is that is a case where I like to be stare, scared and stay scared. Absolutely. Well, on that point, let's wrap her up. Okay, I gotta run. Goodbye, everybody.